So welcome everybody. Thank you so much. Hopefully we all loved the food. Um, courtesy of Arabesque, uh, just to give them a plug because uh, the owner's wife is, is one of our students, so I always love to plug this. Um, a restaurant on Victoria, uh, Victoria Street in Kitchener. Please do visit. Uh, very wonderful food as you've had a chance to experience today. Uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our keynote. Uh, I've had the pleasure of meeting the ambassador uh, of the Republic of Turkey to Canada, uh, Mr. Solchuk Unal, uh, several times, and it's always a treat to hear uh, him. Uh, I do want to point out Ali as well, who's a good friend who's taking a picture of me now, uh, is also the Consulate General in Toronto, uh, also a dear friend, and, and very happy to have uh, both of you here today. Uh, and also, you'll know that the ambassador is a graduate of political science which is wonderful because it just shows you the great career opportunities that you all can have. Uh, is a graduate of the University of Ankara from the Faculty of Political Science, has a very distinguished career as uh, uh, both secretary and uh, a counselor in a number of missions and posts from Doha, Dublin, uh, Ireland, uh, to the UN office in Geneva, and also most recently had a very interesting role as special advisor to the foreign minister, uh, who is now the prime minister, Dabotulu. So very interesting uh, career. And uh, since uh, September of last year, uh, we've had the pleasure of having the ambassador represent Turkey to Canada. So a re really a warm applause, a thank you for the ambassador. We look forward to your comments. Ahlan wa sahlan. Thank you, uh, Professor. Thank you very much. I hope I deserve all these words. Uh, don't get me wrong. I'm not going to read anything. It's just if I need to, figures. But first of all, thank you very much uh, for this very kind invitation. Uh, I hope I deserve the nice words that you have you know, displayed. Uh, yes, uh, I'm a career diplomat of 23 years and uh, working in the service as a graduate of political science. It doesn't mean that every political science graduate becomes uh, an ambassador, but you're all, I think, uh, all uh, candidates of, of ambassadors of your countries, of your nations, of your peoples. So I wish you well, if that's the aim. Uh, but I'll just try to be uh, brief, and then maybe, uh, if you like, we can have uh, an acquaintance session. Uh, what I intend to speak uh, now, uh, it's just actually a tour d'horizon uh, with a brief introduction, uh, tour d'horizon of Turkish foreign policy. Uh, I know the title, of course, it's on Middle East, uh, and I'll come to that in, in the second part of my remarks. Uh, and then uh, I'll uh, say a few words, at least our version of how we uh, see and perceive the situation, especially uh, in Iraq and Syria which is uh, important, which are important components of, uh, of the region. Uh, but let me start with this uh, brief introduction, how we see it, uh, how, the, how we see what happened in the last, last couple of decades. Uh, we in Turkey, we just uh, think that uh, there were three really big systemic shifts or changes uh, in the last couple of decades. The first one, is, of course, was obviously in 1991, which was the end of the Cold War. And it was actually a geopolitical shock to many, if not all. And then after a decade, it was the second shock, which we uh, perceive as, uh, as we perceive is, of course, 2001, which is 9-11. It was a security shock for all, for all countries, for all regions, for all religions. And in 2011, and since 2011, uh, there's this transition in the Mediterranean basin, which actually uh, was one of the uh, topics uh, in the morning sessions. Uh, and it is, uh, in our view, a political and economic shock, uh, which is, I think, we still are talking about and will be talking about uh, for some time. <coughs> What was our response to that? Uh, just with a couple of, you know, uh, points, bullet points, uh, we as Turkish diplomacy responded to these challenges, I would say, uh, with first and foremost more uh, efforts towards regional economic cooperation, 
further economic integration with uh, the neighboring regions, adjacent countries, and neighboring nations, uh, which we also uh, employ the tool of higher level economic and uh, political cooperation mechanisms, which also serves uh, this further uh, economic integration, uh, political integration. And while saying political integration, of course, we mean uh, the focus more on being the economic integration and lifting of not uh, the euro, but de facto, you know, more trade, more cultural connectivity, more cultural relations. So uh, a third one was uh, through regional integration uh, mechanisms, through energy and transportation. Uh, and even though this is not uh, today's topic, uh, Turkey has been and still is a uh, hub for uh, energy and transport uh, connectivity from different aspects, from Central Asia to Balkans, uh, from Russia to Europe, uh, from uh, Eastern Mediterranean to the Balkans. It's a complex web of uh, relations and hub. Uh, and thus, uh, we started to uh, contribute to regional security and prosperity. Uh, and we still are trying uh, our best towards that aim. Uh, of course, uh, in my second part, I would like to uh, start by saying that, to remember that as a, uh, students of political uh, science, uh, Turkey is a, a NATO member, a G20 member, founder of the Council of Europe, uh, OECD, uh, and a uh, negotiating candidate with the EU. Uh, but having said this, uh, if I can just make a, a short reel to, resort, to the horizon uh, clockwise, uh, just taking into consideration the neighbors so that the Turkish foreign policy perhaps could be much better understood by yourselves. And then uh, in the last part, I'll start to talk about uh, how we see uh, uh, the region uh, or Iraq and Syria in, in particular. Just starting from our northern borders, uh, which is actually a very uh, important issue for Canada or Canadian political science studies, is uh, what's happening in Ukraine. Like Canada, we do not uh, agree what's happening there, and uh, especially, uh, first and foremost, uh, the Crimea, we do not recognize uh, what happened there. And we are still, uh, and we will be supporting uh, Ukraine uh, in, in, its ter in its safeguarding of territorial integrity and political unity in this uh, field. Then we have Russia, which we have uh, been adversaries in the Cold War, uh, but when the Cold War was won by one side, uh, start to develop a different set of relationship after uh, the economic uh, crises in this country. Uh, we have an extensive relationship mainly on uh, economic uh, issues, including tourism, transport, of course, energy. And, uh, but this doesn't uh, put us forward in uh, talking candidly with, with the Russian Federation on different issues of uh, mutual and regional concern or international issues. Then uh, coming to the Caucasus, uh, we have a couple of countries over there uh, we have excellent relations, of course, culturally uh, connected, historically connected relations with Azerbaijan, including the uh, energy issues. Another neighbor is, is Georgia, which is under different challenges, which we have been uh, increasing our trade and uh, relationship. Uh, likewise, uh, there's uh, Armenia over there, which we have a different uh, set of uh, relationship. And then we start with talking with the Middle East, uh, which uh, starts with, I think, on the Eastern Front, Iran. Uh, in Iran, oh, we have uh, established, a, I think, sound relationship uh, since uh, 1699, when the uh, border agreement uh, signed at the time didn't change. and. It's, I think, the only country since then our border didn't change. Uh, we have extensive uh, economic issues, likewise many regional issues and challenges that we are talking them openly and candidly, uh, either in a cooperation scheme or in, in you know, uh, in an extension of our views uh, if they are different. And then we are coming to, of course, Iraq and in, in Syria. Now. Uh, 
what, what's happening in Iraq and Syria, which I'll come in a moment uh, in a more detailed fashion, uh, what I can say that while looking into the, uh, these two countries, we just think that uh, we have to first and foremost look to the root causes of the, of the issues, problems, what we have been uh, facing so far. In Iraq, we have, uh, now speaking for bilateral relations, uh, we have an extensive uh, role in their uh, reconstruction efforts by Turkish construction uh, companies operating with thousands of workers there. Uh, we have developed a very good relationship with the uh, Iraqi uh, Kurdish regional government in the north, and we have had, still have, very uh, good uh, and brotherly relations with different groups, political parties, and, and sects uh, in this country. In Syria, uh, of course, uh, before the Arab Spring even started, we have uh, had a change of uh, paradigm uh, in our bilateral relations with Syria, because Syria in the past has been uh, extensively uh, within the framework of the Cold War and afterwards uh, supporting uh, PKK terrorism in Turkey. But then, after a while, I think both sides were able to sit and talk about uh, many issues, including this one, and settled a new start, uh, which uh, we extended a, a warm welcome uh, to the, in this rapprochement. But of course, uh, with the Arab Spring, we, uh, as we have been saying to all countries in the region, we just told them from the very beginning that uh, whatever you do, whatever we'll do, uh, we will not support any government who is uh, going to fight with its own people. And that's still the case. And that's why uh, after uh, the incidents started in uh, Syria, oh, I think I wasn't in Syria, uh, we just said that uh, we are with the people of, of, of Syria. Uh, going uh, towards west, actually to the eastern Mediterranean, Turkey is also uh, neighboring uh, to the island of Cyprus, where the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus uh, is our uh, longtime partner. There is the you know, Greek Cypriot administration over there. From the sea, we can even think that we are uh, far and close neighbors with Egypt. Uh, I mean, talking uh, about uh, borders, sea borders. And then uh, we have uh, Greece, uh, Bulgaria, and from the sea, again, Romania with our neighbors. Now, uh, Greece is, is one of the best examples of our uh, foreign policy in the last uh, decades to further improve our relationship uh, within the paradigm that I've mentioned at the beginning of uh, my remarks. Uh, just to give an example, we have been, you know, so many uh, issues, we still do have some, but uh, either during or after the Cold War, uh, there weren't so many progress in the bilateral relations. But uh, in the last 15 years, 15, yeah, 12 to 15 years, we have signed almost a double of the treaties and agreements that we signed with Greece uh, in the previous time. So it's actually in, in 70, 80 years we just signed, if it was 45 agreements, we have signed almost double of it in the last 15 years because of the improving understanding, improving uh, trade relations, improving cultural and tourism relations, and that's a good example. Uh, of, uh, you know, regional or bilateral uh, economic integration. Uh, with Bulgaria, who has become, uh, and Romania, who have become uh, EU partners, of course, who we have a different uh, set of relationship because of our attachment to the Balkans, to the Balkan countries, to the uh, peoples in those countries, and they're also within the framework of our you know, uh, regional uh, economic integration uh, processes. Uh, so that tour door zone will just stop here, but of course I will be in the question and answer session. I'll be very happy to answer any kind of questions with all of them. But return to Iraq and Syria, maybe I can just start with, uh, in, in general, how we see it at the moment. Uh, because what's going on in these two countries, 
we believe uh, it has become one teacher of war, uh, which I mean uh, two countries should be taken into consideration in a one, one set. Uh, not only because what's happening, or not only because of ISIL, uh, but it's because that border uh, between them uh, practically seems to, or seems to have been evaporating because of uh, issues including terrorism. Now, uh, I just uh, said that we have to look at the root causes uh, on these countries, what's happening now. Uh, why? Because in Iraq, as you might know, after the uh, American intervention, there have been so many frustrations. And when the American uh, government uh, left Iraq, uh, there were so many frustrated groups uh, left behind. Uh, most of them felt departed. Most of them felt that uh, they have been left in cold. And uh, some of them uh, start to perceive another neighboring country uh, much more a threat. Uh, so I think that was one of the uh, issues underlying uh, what happened afterwards, including today's. And in Syria, uh, I think uh, Syria is a, is a country who couldn't really uh, read uh, the symptoms of the Arab Spring from the very beginning, despite our friendly warnings, and who was not able to take to, as you have, uh, as the panel before uh, said, who was not able to take the necessary precautions on time so that they could actually work uh, towards a better uh, country, better rule of law. Now, in, in that period, we have been uh, talking with them uh, in, in detail, and we have uh, advised the Syrian administration at the time uh, to take the necessary measures for a, a better government, rule of law, so that they can embrace the uh, shock waves of the Arab Spring, and they could actually uh, be a, perhaps a model, even, uh, if they have opted for this you know, democratic uh, reform, or at least reform processes. But uh, unfortunately, uh, what we have been uh, telling to them and to other countries have fallen on deaf ears. And then when they start to take a position, a military position against their own people, we just said that we have to we will uh, be side by side with your own people uh, because we cannot uh, tolerate the government fighting against its, its own people. Uh, so, but uh, this of course uh, brings us into a different uh, perspective now, what's happening in Syria, uh, actually also in Iraq. Uh, what is happening is actually has created a big burden, as you very rightly uh, said, uh, for the neighboring countries. Uh, it's not only uh, economic, it's not only political or military or security, but first and foremost, uh, humanitarian uh, issues. On the humanitarian side, every country is, is facing uh, great challenges, and uh, Jordan, Lebanon, of course us, uh, have been trying to cope up with this uh, tragedy of, of people uh, with our own resources. Now, there is uh, one thing every neighboring country, including of my own, are complaining. It's the fatigue in the humanitarian diplomacy uh, of the world. Uh, it is just uh, becoming another uh, circle of uh, refugee crisis where the world or the international community, let me put it that way, uh, it depends on how you define it, is leaving uh, the refugee uh, holders or countries hosting refugees in, in, in the cold with very less or if not uh, any uh, international support. That's something uh, the neighboring countries, including Turkey, have been facing. Just to give a few examples, I mean, it, I will not dwell on the impact of it to the Syrian people, to the Syrian crisis, to the Syrian people, because it was well described. but how it affected us, just so I have to sort of read, just 50,000 Syrian uh, adults have so far uh, completed technical training programs in Turkey. I started with the awkward uh, figure. What does it mean? It actually uh, means uh, a drop in the ocean of, of the burden that we are having. 
and I'm not here, of course, to complain about the burdens, but uh, we have 206,000 Syrian uh, brothers and sisters in 25 camps, and almost 2 million people that we are feeding at the moment, uh, 1.7 million uh, Syrians in Turkey, uh, and the rest either at the zero border or at the, uh, in the camps on the Syrian side of the border. We also have more than 200,000 uh, Iraqi uh, Kurdish or non-Kurdish or Arab uh, refugees or IDPs that we have been either hosting or helping them in the refugee camps, in the IDP camps that we have established in northern Iraq. Uh, that makes a, a good total of uh, almost 2 million. And in that 2 million, uh, we have Syrian kids at school age uh, exceeds half a million, more than 76,000 76, students receiving education by almost 2,000 uh, 2, teachers in uh, 1,000 classrooms. And uh, over 30,000 Syrians have undergone medical operations in the last four years in Turkey. More than 50,000 Syrian babies have been born in, in Turkey. Of course, these figures are almost equal or similar for other uh, and valid for other uh, neighboring countries. But can you imagine 50,000 Syrian babies born or XYZ country national babies born in a different country that they never know of, that their uh, parents uh, have become uh, guests or refugees or, or you know, in a country uh, that they never know of. Uh, so this list can be prolonged, but uh, it is just to give you an idea uh, what the neighboring countries are under, or what kind of a uh, burden they are, and what kind of a burden that we are under. Uh, in that, I think we do not receive uh, much international help. And with that, I'm not pinpointing any country, any uh, organization or whatsoever. But that's reality. Uh, it was told in one of the previous panels that you know the decreasing uh, interest of the press. Uh, yes, that's the reality. Uh, that shouldn't be the reality, but that's the case, perhaps. But uh, this, I think, is one of the issues that we all have to think and talk about. Not today, but maybe uh, it's another day's cup of tea. But. Uh, we have to talk separately about humanitarian diplomacy. Uh, and my point here is just, you know, the fatigue of the international community, the fatigue of the other welfare nations with other issues uh, is actually affecting other countries as well. Now, uh, closing this bracket and returning to the uh, Iraq and Syria issue, of course, uh, we also uh, have uh, the uh, Daesh, or the ISIL uh, in its English terms, problem. Uh, on that, our analysis, uh, starting fr from Syria this time, is uh, th this group is actually one of the components of a bigger Iraqi terror organization, which we, since 2005, have been uh, notifying as a uh, terror organization in our books. Uh, it is, of course, uh, having different components, uh, local uh, extremists, foreign fighters, which is a different uh, issue that we have to talk about, uh, local tribes, uh, but the bulk is, is Iraqi origin. And in, on the Iraq side of it, uh, there are more than a couple of groups, again, the foreign fighters, again, the you know, uh, local extremist groups, let me put it that way, uh, the, with the terrorist, of course, uh, elements, but also uh, there are people or there are tribes who have been frustrated for this or that reason. And that's why uh, for the Iraqi aspect of the matter, we believe uh, we have to go to the root causes. That's why we, the Turkish uh, diplomacy, let's say, believes that we have to first uh, deal with Iraq and think ways of people, if there is any possibility, to take them back to the political track in the uh, legislative parliament in Baghdad, if we can. And of course, in the meantime, continue to fight against terrorism uh, as much as we can, and support uh, a central government in Baghdad, 
uh, who would be willing, who is willing, and who is hugging its own peoples, including uh, Arabs, uh, Kurds, Turkmen, Sunni, Shia, everybody. Uh, without that kind of a government, we don't think that uh, the Iraqi aspect could be successful. Now, uh, with the new government, I can say that uh, there are good signs of it. This, this government is working uh, very well with many countries, including Turkey, with the West, and it's also trying to reach out to many uh, you know, societies of their, of their country. That's very important. But it doesn't stop there, of course. Then we come back to, to Syria, and that's why uh, the Syrian component of this organization is also a part of it. Uh, on that, we, as Turkey, have uh, two points uh, regarding the Syrian aspect of it. We believe uh, we also have to go to the root causes of the issue in Syria and talk about the regime issue because uh, and it's not a uh, boots on the grounds issue it is actually a political solution uh, that is uh, achievable that is sustainable as we were very close in 2012 in Geneva under the auspices of the UN uh, at the time uh, the Syrian uh, regime uh, has started uh, talks with uh, moderate opposition in Geneva under the USP, under the UN auspices, but then it failed because, to our belief, that it, they just you know uh, either didn't feel enough pressure, or felt more comfortable with the uh, with the international or regional allies. Uh, the second point that we as Turkey would like to make all the time is, to, of course, the foreign fighters issue. That's a very important issue that uh, we are also. Uh, feeling as a national security threat to us because uh, these people have conducted a couple of terror uh, incidents in Turkey, also captured our uh, consulate in Mosul and its staff for three, more than, uh, longer than three months. But there are also other uh, foreign fighters uh, belonging to different groups, different countries in this, in this country. So we also think that uh, these should be always uh, taken into consideration and addressed equally, at least. Uh, of course, it's not a tit for tat, but uh, there are more than a perhaps a dozen of foreign fighters in, in this country. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, in a nutshell, how we believe. And one thing, of course, uh, sorry, I forgot that. I'll again reconnect myself with the humanitarian aspect, which is also uh, incoming with the political uh, issue that we are uh, safeguarding, and it's some kind of safe or secure zone to be established in, in Syria. We are uh, of the view that uh, we need some kind of a safe zone or secure zone zones uh, within Syria so that we can uh, first of all, make a deterrence uh, to the Syrian regime from the air, not by boots on the ground, uh, keep the Syrian people, IDPs, and possible refugees in Syria, in those camps, so that the international community can extend a real uh, humanitarian hand to those areas without any security threat or intimidation uh, from the uh, Syrian government or from other terrorist groups. And then the burden on Turkey first, and of course uh, on the uh, neighboring countries could at least somewhat uh, alleviated or decreased. Because this issue uh, is getting now, of course, uh, more importance by not being uh, remaining in the humanitarian premises, but also especially in Lebanon, uh, being a security uh, and public order issue as well. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, just to repeat uh, what we believe uh, in, in the Middle East in general is the you know, uh, support of the uh, legitimate wishes of the people in general. Uh, that was and it still is our policy regarding the Arab Spring uh, as we uh, name it. Uh, but in particular, Iraq and Syria, which are more important issues and has become a national security issue as well, not only for other regional or international uh, circles, but also for us. And that's also something that we 
really intent to as Turkey and contribute to the peaceful efforts and diplomatic efforts to solve the issue. And then I will stop. I think I'm just on 30 minutes. The ambassador has agreed to take questions. Um, I am going to ask uh, for you to please use the mic so that we can record this. Would anybody like to ask a question? And while somebody's putting up their hand and thinking of their question, I'll abuse my authority and ask a question if I may. Of course. Um, let me ask you about, if I can, I'm, I'm an avid watcher of Turkish politics, so I have to have to ask you your thoughts on uh, on what's going on in Turkish politics, which is never a boring moment, by the way. It's, it's always, in the Middle East, the Turkish soap operas are the most popular soap operas. They're dubbed into Arabic, but Recently, uh, uh, the Turkish politics has been a new soap opera <laughs> that we've enjoyed watching. As a political scientist, this is a, a lovely moment to watch. Um, I really want to get your thoughts on where you think the peace process is with the Kurds. Um, what's your take on the um, the prospects of that? So there's been a few setbacks, of course, with, with Kobani and other places of, of in Syria. Um, I'd love for you to reflect a little bit on where you think uh, the future of the Kurdish uh, peace process is going. And my second question, again, I'm really abusing my power, um, is what do you think of, of the again, the Kurdish political party that is doing so well? Um, your, your former boss is going to have a, a, a big challenger, potentially, uh, in the new Kurdish party. But it seems to be crossing and taking some potential votes in, in liberal urban areas uh, in Istanbul, um, really interesting that we're seeing a Kurdish party, which I've talked about the Kurdish question to my class, um, suddenly becoming a very interesting, viable, perhaps mainstream political party. So if you may, I'd love for you to reflect on that, and then I'm going to walk around the room to see who wants to abuse the next position. Thank you. Shall I go one by one, or we'll take a few and then? Feel free to answer as you wish. Then I'll just, you know, heed with what you have asked. Uh, I'll start with the internal process that you asked. Uh, yes, the terrorism issue is, is, is and has been very real in Turkey, stemming from the uh, PKK terrorism. And uh, as you rightly said, uh, there has been internal progress ongoing for, for some years. And uh, it, it seems uh, it's uh, going in, in the right direction. Of course, in every kind of process, in every kind of political process, uh, there could be different of opinion, differences of opinions, different views, different attitudes, ups and downs, you know, uh, ins and outs. That's actually the nature of politics. And, uh, but the most important thing here, in my opinion, uh, and of course, I have to tell you that I'm, not a, I'm, I'm just a diplomat, I'm not a politician. Uh, but uh, the most important thing here is uh, we in, in Turkey, we have a parliamentary uh, democracy, and what's been happening is actually uh, going within the framework of this, uh, you know, parliamentary democracy uh, rules and regulations. And in that, of course, uh, the party that you referred to uh, is one of the parties uh, taking part in the parliament for, for several years. And uh, that comes with the uh, democracy, which is, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, now, just to refer to a couple of facts, uh, going back to Kobani, this uh, process was sort of uh, affected uh, by some developments regarding the instance in Kobani. But on that, uh, from a diplomatic point of view, uh, we will have to remember that when uh, Kobani started, or the incident, or the attacks in, in Kobani started, uh, Turkey uh, was the first country who sent humanitarian uh, assistance to that region. In just uh, two weeks, we have sent uh, more than 200 trucks. And in, uh, in a month's time, our humanitarian assistance uh, over uh, reached uh, the equivalent of a $20 million uh, humanitarian uh, supplies. Uh, because we don't have any kind of uh, discrimination, we cannot, no one can, in the humanitarian uh, diplomacy. And of course, uh, the people of Kobane, they have relatives in Turkey. We can't stay uh, ignorant to that uh, issue. But our support to the region, to that region, uh, didn't stop there. It actually 
uh, we also, secondly, became a gateway for other countries, uh, international humanitarian relief operations to that region. And thirdly, uh, we have been talking with them on different issues that, but afterwards, uh, we immediately uh, allowed uh, Turkish borders to be used by the uh, Iraqi uh, Peshmerga forces uh, through Turkey as well as uh, other moderate opposition groups, again through Turkey, to go and help their uh, friends, their allies, or the groups in Kobani. And just to let you know that there was not only one group fighting in Kobani against uh, Daesh or, or the regime, uh, there were actually eight groups. And they have, were not in uh, sort of in harmony for a while. And when they sort of decided on a joint command, then things, uh, of course, start to go in the right direction. And of course, the Western air support arrived. Uh, and then how we, uh, you know, handled it. But of course, it affected uh, other uh, Kurdish societies in, in uh, every country, not only uh, in Turkey. But on that, I have to uh, say that uh, Turkey faced uh, uh, unfair criticism for a while, saying that, well, uh, your tanks are just staying there doing nothing. If that's a criticism, I would ask the owner of the criticism, what do you want me to do? To invade a country just, you know, outright like that? Uh, to go without any international support? Or to go into uh, Syria without any kind of assurances, I mean international partners' assurances? So that's why we just uh, refrained from doing that. And time actually proved us, because we always uh, said that with humanitarian support with uh, other kind of support, uh, the issue could be handled uh, in a shorter time, which was the case. Now, returning to your second uh, question, of course, uh, we have to go maybe backpedal a while. Uh, just a couple of years ago, there were, uh, two years ago, there was a, a referendum in Turkey uh, which uh, opened uh, different ways uh, or different sort of uh, reforms in, in human rights issues, including ombudsman, you know, uh, another new political development election of the president for the first time by popular vote. Uh, that one actually uh, paved the way in the presidential elections for uh, the leader of the, the, this party to be a candidate. And he rallied in the uh, 82 uh, provinces of Turkey without an interruption. And he got a vote, of course, like everybody, everybody else did. And this is also, uh, this is only just a natural uh, outcome of democracy. And I think everybody is happy about that. Now, uh, in the now uh, legislative elections, uh, whether they will go do good or not, I think the voter will say it about that. Uh, but uh, it's tourism, of course, I can't speak on behalf of them or on behalf of any politician, but it's uh, tourism to say that like every political party in every democratic country, they are trying to uh, garner support of uh, you know, people from every walk of life. The other party is also doing the same, or Canadian parties are also doing the same. So uh, I think it's, it's just normal, uh, and it's becoming, uh, or it's, it's maturation of, of politics, of their politics, I mean, as well. Thank you. Over here, Ambassador, sorry. <laughs> it's Lauren Dawson from the University of Waterloo. I just wanted to follow up on the comments you made towards the end of your, uh, your speech, where you alluded to a number of foreign fighter groups, you, I think, said 12, but that's a bit vague. I was wondering if you could clarify what you had in mind, and then you implied there was a policy implication in terms of how Turkey would respond to the foreign fighter issue in taking into consideration this still unspecified uh, number of groups. So could you clarify and talk a bit about the policy implication? Th thank you very much for raising that. Uh, what I meant and what I was uh, going to say, uh, if I had more detailed time, but uh, it's actually, uh, there are now uh, three main Syrian umbrella groups, let me put it that way. It's not exactly an organigram, 
The, the first one is, is uh, the terrorist groups. And they include foreign fighters as well, from every country. Uh, so there are a couple of them, and some of them are more prominent, some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller. It depends on how they define it themselves. So on that, I think it's, it's uh, futile to name them as a or to list them. There is uh, a group, let's say, uh, which uh, we call it as the moderate opposition. And as far as we know, they are very careful on not allowing foreign fighters among them. But I think it would not be a surprise if any Syrian, for example, from Canada going and joining them. Uh, who, who knows who is he or who is she? The third group is, is uh, again, uh, belonging to uh, opposition groups. Uh, there are many Kurdish groups of whom are divided among themselves as well. Uh, most of them are with the moderate opposition, but they also keep their ethnic identity, and they are generally very weak or small. Uh, there's another one, a bigger, more armed group, uh, which we call as PYD. Uh, they, they are the ones who generally uh, have never fought with the regime so far, like the uh, uh, Daesh groups. They never shot a single bullet to each other. And uh, they in, instead, in the past at least, preferred to make a dominance among the other Kurdish groups uh, who are closer to Iraqi Kurds and to dominate them uh, either by coercion or violence or by other means. And that's why, uh, uh, unlike the established or unlike the misperception, the PYD uh, does not have a very good relationship, historically or currently, with the Iraqi Kurds. But of course, in this issue in Kobani, uh, there was uh, some kind of different uh, alliances. Uh, but don't be under uh, a misinterpretation uh, that the Iraqi Kurds only rush there for the PYD. On the contrary, there are other groups that they are much more interested, that they are attached from feudal links and so on and so forth. So this is the Syrian aspect of it. There is also an un-Syrian aspect of it, which was very well addressed in the previous panels. There are at least two big groups, or armies if you like, or militias uh, from two different countries with uh, thousands of people, of whom are putting banners, their the list of their, their matries in two different capitals in the region. So uh, that's why, uh, but nobody's talking about them. I mean, we are talking about them, but it's also a foreign fighter issue. That's what I meant. Thank you. Ambassador, my name is David DeWitt. <clears throat> I'm with CG, New York University and soon the Canadian Forces College. Um, I, was in, I was interested in your tour de raison, um, in particular because there was a gap. And I'm curious if you could explain that. Um, throughout the 80s and 90s, and into about 2005, and actually earlier than the 80s, but in particular in the late 80s and early 90s, there was an, an intensification of formal military, security, intelligence, and economic relations, uh, and academic exchanges between Israel and Turkey. You did your two to rise on, and the one country you didn't mention was Israel. So I'm curious about that. Um, now, I know the Mamara incident created some difficulties, and I know that part of the difficulties were exasperated because it fit into a political agenda within Turkey that was cracking down on secularization, that wanted to be, show its Islamicist credentials, and was also in the process of increasingly treating journalists with some difficulty. Um, and so that, that all fit. Uh, but I also know that Sub Rasa, in the midst of all this. Who's that, sorry? So below the, the oh, table. Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Mm -hmm. Below the, the, the table, the Turkish military and the Israeli military continue to cooperate. Security relations continue, both directly and via NATO. And there continue to be economic exchanges and investments. So I understand the political sensitivity, but I'm curious why you would go out of your way to miss one of these principal countries. Thank you. No, I didn't. Uh, there was no intention. And uh, thank you for asking that. 
while I was making this tour door zone, I uh, said maybe, but it was missed uh, because I was talking too quickly. I, I, this tour door zone was based on on neighborhood. I mean, having a neighbor neighbor uh, neighborhood. I mean, uh, at, uh, joint border. We don't have a border with, with uh, Israel, even from sea. But I will answer the question, of course. Uh, and there is, uh, it wasn't secret that we have had extensive uh, relations uh, with Israel, uh, going back to actually uh, centuries with the Jewish people. Uh, first and foremost, Turkey was the first Muslim country who recognized Israel after it was uh, declared. And then uh, afterwards, we have had, uh, I think, uh, different levels of relationship. But because we feel, we felt ourselves, we feel ourselves uh, a, a friend uh, of Israel in the past, we always told the truth. And we always mentioned uh, our views regarding uh, Palestine and Middle East, Arab-Israeli conflict, because we believe that they were uh, reflecting at least our, our version of truth. And that's why this relationship had ups and downs in the past as well. Now, uh, returning today, as you have mentioned, uh, there was an incident in, uh, regarding Mav Marmara. It was a really serious instance. More, maybe serious is not the right term as well, because for the first time in Turkish modern history, uh, Turkish citizens were killed by a regular army. Even during the Second War, we didn't happen to see something like that. And uh, I don't want to go to in detail of the Mar Marmara incident here, but I can if you like. Uh, throughout this whole process, there was also a very close dialogue, not only with, uh, with the Israeli government, but other governments as well, so that this issue uh, could have been uh, you know, uh, handled without violence. But the thing is, while uh, when uh, this, this relationship uh, was disrupted because of the killing of 10 uh, Turkish citizens, one of them being a Turkish American as well, uh, it, it was, I think, inevitable. Uh, there were some conditions that we have set forth. Some of them have been met, some of them are, are not. And that process is still, I think, ongoing. Whether we will have something or not, I think uh, time will show all of us. Uh, but in the meantime, we will not, uh, we cannot stay behind of our uh, policy uh, regarding Palestine uh, because we believe uh, the peace in the Arab-Israeli conflict uh, could be reached. Uh, but for that, everybody has to work. That's what we have been uh, telling to the uh, Israeli side and Israeli uh, people. And of course, in that, we always, and we still are making a distinction between the relations between government and uh, between uh, the relations between people to people uh, or, or you know, with the jury. Uh, one thing about uh, you mentioned, uh, after the Mahabh Marmar incident, actually, I, I, I think the uh, military relations <coughs> did stop. Uh, we don't have uh, a military cooperation uh, with them. Uh, for the economic exchanges, uh, I think uh, no one is uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, blocking uh, economic or commercial relations between two peoples or two companies. And uh, that's why uh, neither them nor us uh, did something except then governmental economic relations. Uh, the other issue is, is, is uh, continuing. I don't know whether it's for his answer. Thank you. This is our final question from a student. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so my name is Rashid from Wolfer Luria University. Um, jumping back to the aspect of the refugee, um, with the growing numbers in all these uh, specific neighboring countries, and especially in Turkey, uh, more specifically in this topic, uh, is there a specific plan or level of capacity for the Turkey um, that they initially implanted on, because the numbers are growing. Um, we don't see any sign of resolution anytime soon, which is unfortunate, um, but is there a certain strategy or capacity that is placed by the Turkish government? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, we have three levels of response uh, to the issue of uh, people coming into Turkey. The first one, 
It started from the very first day. Uh, the night that we uh, learned that the first group, I remember very well, 150 uh, Syrian uh, people were crossing the border. We just felt that we have to take a uh, very quick response. And uh, with the increasing number of uh, the you know, Syrian uh, people coming in, we, of course, uh, established and constructed more camps. These are nationally uh, run camps in cooperation with the UNHCR. Uh, and there is a system in that. Those 25 camps that uh, we have built are hosting now 260,000 Syrians. And in the camps, we have schools, we have vocational training skills, we have medical clinics run by the Turkish authorities in cooperation with the UNHCR, but, run, I mean, but employed by either uh, Syrians themselves or uh, other Arab uh, national, nationals which we sort of ask to be employed from different countries like Egypt, Jordan, you know, Lebanon, uh, because we believe language should not be a barrier and that's the most important thing. These camps are now today shown by uh, many countries, many refugee uh, NGOs as well as the UNHCR as, as you know, uh, exemplar camps, which I think they are. But at one point, uh, it was much difficult for us to continue with the construction of camps. Why? Because the, here comes the second aspect of response. We have been constructing, we, we are able to construct a camp of 10,000 people in one month. And it's not an easy job. I mean, you're actually building a town. But over one night, we have many instances that over one night we have uh, 10,000 or tens of thousands of people crossing the border. So in other words, our uh, ability to construct a camp uh, was not able to, uh, to compete with the brutality of the Syrian regime. That's as simple as that. That's why uh, the second aspect comes in, uh, and there the you know, national departments, ministries, NGOs, you know, municipalities, uh, even the men on the street, they are trying to help uh, to the Syrian people uh, as much as they can. Uh, the third kind of response was actually uh, divided, or is actually divided into two kind of uh, technical responses. And these are, uh, if I may, uh, the first kind of their uh, examples in the humanitarian world. The first one is, you know, opening and constructing and opening a, comp uh, a camp, an IDP camp, in another company, in another country's uh, a company and uh, territories, which is the case in Iraq. Also in Syria, uh, this happened. But the second one is maybe more important that we have. We had to develop a new system uh, that uh, our humanitarian uh, workers and trucks, they are coming to the Syrian border. We call it the zero border, uh, zero point uh, exchange. And then exchange everything to the Syrian lorries with Syrian uh, drivers. Because in the international humanitarian uh, rules and regulations, you are not allowed to go into a, a third country uh, you cannot send your humanitarian workers to that country uh, unless there is consent. Of course, there is no consent issue here, but it's also a security matter. The third response, the third kind of response under this third uh, leg is also to establish or to help to establish the Syrian people uh, either IDP or refugee camps in Syria so that we can you know, extend humanitarian uh, assistance to those camps with the method that I have explained, uh, so that they can keep their people uh, there uh, in a sort of form of totality. But are they enough? No. Uh, no country's uh, efforts are enough. That's why uh, we, the neighboring countries, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, and Turkey, uh, need much more uh, international assistance. And without international assistance, uh, you cannot cope with this uh, crisis. And we also have to think that one day these people, they already want to go back, but uh, they will go back. And uh, the international community should also start thinking about it uh, with a forward-looking uh, perspective. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, Ambassador. We have learned so much and appreciate your time, Professor Unal. This is a small gift from the University of Waterloo, and uh, it's heavy because, um, as all professors know, there's one good way to, to get rid of the complimentary books that you get when you publish. It's to, it's to and, uh, and self-promote, so there's my books in there. That's why it's nice and heavy. Um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much.